Toss aside the touchy-feely notions of love in business and recognize the real power it holds. Welcome to the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast with host Steve Farber, drawing on his work with a wide variety of companies from the Fortune 100 to smaller family-owned businesses. Farber shares inspiring interviews with business leaders and proven strategies for how you can create experiences that your customers will love by developing a culture that your employees, teammates, and colleagues love working in. Discover why and how love at the end of the day is just a damn good business for you too. Here's your host, Steve Farber. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Love is Just Damn Good Business podcast. I'm your host, Steve Farber, although you probably already know that from the little intro that you just listened to. Uh, welcome. Uh, my guest today is uh, Werner Berger. Now, I want to introduce Werner by way of this book right here, which, by some startling coincidence, is also called Love is Just Damn Good Business. Because you see, I wrote about Werner in this book. So by way of introduction, I want to read you just a little snippet of what I said in the book about this amazing gentleman joining us today. I first met Warner Berger when he was 79 years young and on a quest to do something big. Now that phrase years young might sound like a euphemism, just a nice way of giving his age without calling him, you know, old. And there's no doubt that anyone who has made 79 trips around the sun is in fact no spring chicken, but Berger's youth remains evident in his attitude and in his lifestyle. And the quest that I referred to is a prime example. When Berger and I talked, he was preparing to climb Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. With an elevation of 19,341 feet, it's the highest mountain in Africa. Where else would you want to celebrate your 80th birthday, right? Berger already has a spot in the Guinness Book of World Records is the oldest person to have climbed the highest mountain on all seven continents, a feat he completed when he was a young man of 77. But he wants to do it all again, and that was before 2020, and we'll find out if that happened in a moment. But the question is why? Why did he want to do that? And there's a real simple answer to that, climbing mountains, is something Werner loves to do. So, Werner, welcome to the show. I'm so excited for uh, for folks to meet you and to hear your story. Thank you, Steve. Totally delighted to be here. So, I'm assuming uh, that, or one would assume, that if you were climbing challenging mountains in your late 70s, that um, mountain climbing must have been a lifelong pursuit for you, something you started when you were a wee lad and worked your way up through the course of seven decades. Is that the way it started? Steve, everybody has the opportunity of being wrong sometimes. <laughs> and this is yours. <laughs> I started climbing uh, when I did my first trek to Everest Base Camp when I was 55 and just completely fell in love with the experience. Hmm. 55. Okay. So that, they're all the stereotypes uh, out the window for, um, for what it takes to be a world-class anything, right? Because the assumption is world-class fill in the blank. It's something you got to start when you're really young and maybe you're, maybe you were a child prodigy and you went to school for it and you trained for it from the, you know, from the time you could first walk. But at 55 years old, what, what inspired you to take on that kind of a challenge at that uh, at that age? I was sitting in a self-development workshop and the guy in front of the room said, think of three things that you would love to do before you die, but you don't think you ever would. The movie, The Bucket List hadn't come out yet, so he couldn't refer to it as what's on your bucket list. Right. And because I was born in Africa and knew about Kilimanjaro, I thought, oh, wouldn't it be neat if I could climb Kilimanjaro? And then I thought, but everybody knows this beautiful mountain in Switzerland, the Matterhorn, wouldn't that be neat? And in 1953, when 
Hillary and Tenzing got to the top of Everest, I was 16. And I was just really enthused by what had happened. None of the other kids seemed to give a darn, but to me it was, wow. And somehow that stuck in my mind. And so the third thing I wanted to do is simply trek to Everest Base Camp and see this phenomenal mountain. Never thinking that any of this would happen, but my adventurous son, my second oldest, said one day, you know, Dad, you said you wanted to trek to Everest Base Camp. Why don't we do it? So next year we went. And for me, that was a life changing experience. And that was and at what? I, how I, old were you then? 55, 56? 55. 55. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so you're sitting in, in a workshop and you're doing that exercise, uh, the bucket list exercise, although it wasn't called that. And I would guess that any one of us that's ever been on any kind of a personal development workshop or seminar has done something similar. Right. And, you know, the, the questions are phrased, you know, in different ways. Maybe it's um, uh, what would you do if nobody was watching or if you if you if you were guaranteed to not fail, what would you do? There's lots of ways we ask that kind of potentiality question. But there was something that happened in you in that moment where you said, no, I, I really want to do this. And it sounds like part of what happened for you is you shared that with your son and he was the one who held you accountable to your own words, I guess you could say. Yeah, his adventurous spirit kicked in. And actually, I still remember when I went home after the three days and told my family, this is what I came up with. Everybody sort of chuckled and thought, you know, what would an old fellow like this uh, want to start climbing? Um, but then, who knows? Just what the triggers are that make something like that happen because I know to this moment, the minute he mentioned it, my gut just said, yes. <laughs> ah, so, so it wasn't simply an intellectual, oh, wouldn't that be nice? You felt it on a very deep level. Oh, absolutely. Never ever realizing what I was going to get out of that experience. So if your son hadn't have uh, prompted you and encouraged you, would you have done it, you think? I really don't know. Some circumstances would have needed to have been right. And more than likely, it would have taken somebody else to say, OK, let's go and do it. I, I'm not sure of that. I really have not even thought of that. Yeah. So the, the power, I mean, it's the, needless, it's the, it's the power of uh, the power of encouragement, right? And belief. So obviously, your, your son, what's, what's your son's name? Paul. P -A -U -L. Paul. Paul. So Paul obviously would not have prompted you to do that unless he believed that you were capable of it. Right? So, oh, so he, I think so. Otherwise, unless, unless he just wanted, you know, early access to your will. No, <laughs> no. He would have known that I was capable because, you know, I play tennis with my kids. We water ski together. We snow ski together. So it wasn't that I was a couch potato and right. you know, needed to drop a lot of weight to get ready. It was just a case of getting into ac action. Um, I don't even remember, maybe three or four months before. We were ready, both of us. So you were already an athletic person. Uh, you already had an adventurous spirit. You're, and Paul also had an adventurous spirit. And, and being your son, he said, you, dad, are... I heard what you said. You are capable of this. This is not a fantasy. This, this is a real possibility, so let's do it. And that's what hooked you, but that's not where it stopped. That's just where it started. So how did it unfold from there? Well, I came back from that trek absolutely having had a fabulous time. And I started realizing, and this is days and weeks and months later, that every time I thought of that experience, something shifted in me. Uh, some glow sort of emanated. Um, some feeling of well-being emanated. And I realized that for the first time in my life, I was conscious of what it was like to be in the moment. And that's an exhilarating experience. And I suspect that that was the hook because from here I wanted more 
And then I thought of, um, okay, so if I want more, what am I going to do? And the automatic answer was climb more mountains, spend more time in that kind of an environment. And the more I did, the more I got hooked. So that, that experience of being in the moment is because that's what's required to climb a mountain. And it's not only for an hour or two or three at a time. It was for days at a time where the focus is on every step or the next thing you do. It's not on what happened yesterday. It's not on what's going to happen tomorrow. It's just what is the next thing you need to do? The next step, the next foothold, the next handhold. Yeah. Right. And I had no idea that there would be a shift as a result of that because I'd done one day adventures. I'd done two day adventures. I'd done outward bound things that were similar, but I'd not done anything that had the length of this particular trek because we, we made it harder than the standard one. We came in from a place called Jiri, which added, which should have added eight days to the trek. We did it in six, but we were both ready. Wow. So did that experience of being present when you were climbing the mountain, did that carry over into the rest of your life after the experience? I mean, some of it didn't, obviously, because you said you wanted to replicate it, right? Which means you had to go back to another mountain to have that experience again. But, but to what degree, if at all, did it carry over into your day-to-day -day life? It comes and it goes. Um, but the key here for me is I've now really experienced it. I have a sense of knowing what it feels like to be grounded in it. And so I can regenerate it when I have the sense that I'm out of sync. And it's really not just uh, being in the moment. It's it, what comes along with that. And what the key thing that comes along with that is just incredible awe and amazement and, and thankfulness that we live in this kind of an environment, whether it's my room right now, or whether it's the, the, med, the, med, the I can't get the word out, the magicness, that's not the right word. Mag just magic, the magic. Yeah, the ma magic majesty. Yeah, the mad, that's the word. The majesty of the mountains and the majesty of, you know, literally everything. And it could be a night sky and just being blown away and feeling so small, not diminished, but just humble in this magnificence and having the same sense of love for the fellow climbers. And, and it really deepened the empathy that and I've always been empathic, but it really deepened the empathy. And I understood that in that environment, even the strong sometimes need help. Mm. And when they allow you to help, there's, there's a elation in it. When they say, no, 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 I don't need help, but they're dragging the team back. It's also an understanding that they now in their macho mode, they can't give in. Uh, and when they can give in, it is just such a pleasure to be able to support them. Um, so the strong sometimes need help. And it's so amazing sometimes that people that are uh, a little slower, or you might think, you know, they're not going to do as well. It is amazing how they can shine um, as long as you don't rush them. Hmm. You have to let people go at their own speed. And when they go at their own speed and they have support, there is nothing that they cannot accomplish. My first trek that I took people to Everest Base Camp, I had 40 people with me. Every single person made it. The youngest was 18. The oldest was 84. Wow. Yeah, it's a, when a team works together. Actually, we came away feeling like a family. And the second last night, we got to a place called Fortse, and it couldn't accommodate all 40 of us. So we were broken into two, what's called Sherpa tea houses. And the team 
really suffered from that split. They, they did not want that split, but we had no option. <laughs> it was just an amazing experience. The, the translation of that, you know, is, is so, it's, it's so obvious to um, other contexts as well. You know, it takes a certain level of teamwork, obviously, to make it up a mountain. Uh, and the dynamics really aren't that different in any team, in any business, in any business, for example. The stakes are different, though, right? I mean, when you're climbing a mountain together, it's literally life or death in some circumstances, if not all. I mean, we hear about casualties all the time on a mountain. You don't hear too many life or death stories from business teams. but Except emotionally except emotionally. We have yeah. emotional deaths that are much harder to come back from. Well, an, an emotional, well, it really, that's kind of an interesting, interesting angle on it. Um, I don't know that anything's harder to come back from than an actual physical death. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we could, we could debate that one, I suppose. But, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it could be hard for an entire team to come back from as well. And the other thing that I was I was struck by is your um, kind of calling out the the people who struggle more and need help can really be the greatest sources of inspiration, right? Because it's it because they obviously have to overcome something else in order to make it compared to somebody who's you know that macho kind of you know, super athlete or whatever. It's like you, you give, you still give the applause, but for that person, it's like, well, yeah, that makes sense coming from you. You climb the mountain, you know, you hardly even lost, you know, lost your breath. But for somebody else who wanted to give up every step of the way and makes it all the way, that's inspiring. And in fact, so many times the super athletes struggle the most because they do two things. They go too fast and they cocky. Yeah. They think this is gonna be a breeze. And from a physical perspective or the capability in a strict physical um, strength sense, it is a breeze. But the minute you put altitude into the game right. and they start struggling for breath, it's no longer under their control uh -huh. unless they do what you tell them to do. And what you tell them to do is breathe really deeply and not be embarrassed when they have to go. <sighs> right. Or when you say to them, slow down and change the way you're taking your step. Kick into what is called the climber step or the rest step, which simply means that every time you step, there's a split second of relaxation and then you step again. And the super athlete doesn't want to do that. They just want to go, 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 which means that their muscles are constantly in motion and constantly stressed and burn out more rapidly than the slower person. So they're literally little micro rests. Tiny in ones. In each step. Yep. You take a step, you relax for just a second, you take a step. But while you relaxed, um, your weight is equally distributed on both feet so that you, you're not stressing your leg muscles. Interesting. And of course, a deep breathing, you're sucking in more oxygen. Right. And especially when you're pressure, pressure breathing, which means you're exhaling. But again, the, the macho guy doesn't want to need to do that. Right, right. Because in a, in a, in a typical workout, you know, it's only the out of shape people who are, who are out of breath. Yeah. Right. Yep. <clears throat> and here it's and it just shows because, weakness. <laughs> yeah. And it shows weakness because yeah, they're out of shape. Right. <laughs> so as of then 2013, November mm -hmm. of 2013, mm -hmm. you became the oldest person in the world at 77. Uh, 76 or 77. Um, okay. To complete the, the seven, the seven summit. What, what do you, what do you call that series or? It's, it's just called the seven summits and it's the highest peak on each of the seven continents. 
And actually, um, I did an eight one because the mountain in Australia, which is really the highest peak on that continent, is very, very low. But from a climber's perspective, it gets replaced with a mountain called um, Karsten's Pyramid in Papua New Guinea. So okay. that's the one I did. Um, Gosh, was it 77 or 76? I can't remember. 2013. Must have been 76. So so you then No, 77, because I was already into my next year. Gotcha. So the um the one in Australia was just a bonus mountain? Just just yeah, to say just only, to say you did it? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just it's the tallest peak on that continent. Right. And what was so funny, as I was going toward the summit, families with babes in arms we're coming back down oh. because it's only 7,200 feet. Right. You don't see that on Everest, for example. <laughs> no way. <laughs> and I did not anticipate that. Yeah. So your, your background is, is actually in kind of the business consulting leadership development sort of world, right? Is that, is that what you did in your early days in your career? I own my own business for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, retired at age 43 because I was tired of what I consider I was working for my employees because what I learned is I was not a good leader. I did not know. I did not have any models for good leadership. So I just expected them to do certain things. Um, and although I liked them, I wasn't, they were too the two keys that I learned on the mountains that correlate to leadership. One of them is the ability to be assertive when you need to take a stance or to be able to stand back when it's necessary. And the other one is just to have very high empathy. And if you have those two things and you congruent with them, then you can connect with people. And of course, what we all want to do is connect with people. You, and that's what love is all about. It's just a very deep connection or caring for the other person or having a sense what it's like to be in their shoes without working at doing it. It's got to come from the inside. It, it, it's almost got to be an automatic to be truly authentic. Because as a corporate leadership consultant, what I saw over and over and over, and it didn't matter whether it was sales training or customer service training or managerial skills or leadership skills, people would walk away from a workshop saying, oh my gosh, I've learned so much. This is the best thing since sliced bread. This is gonna change how I do my business. Six months later, they don't remember the name of the course. Yeah. Leave alone having implemented any of the skills. And I fully understand why that happens, because until they know who they are, and until they know they are comfortable with themselves and can truly look outside, not always being thrown into me, 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 they can't implement the skills right. that they say are so critical, which of course has everything to do with a win-win environment. And that's the difference, it sounds to me, is the difference between um, the intellectual understanding of, let's say, a leadership concept and the actual experience of love and empathy for the people that you're leading. Yeah. I can understand that I'm supposed to feel that way, mm -hmm. and I can do the mechanics of acting that way. I can write the personal notes. I can say thank you to people. I can take them to dinner. I can... You know, there's lots of, of things that I can do, but, but unless that intellectual understanding is connected with something that I'm feeling and experiencing, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't last. And yeah. I imagine on the mountain, there's no choice. It, your, your intellectual understanding of what it takes to, uh, to, to climb and how to use the equipment and, and your, your intellectual understanding of, of the physiological effect of high altitude that doesn't do you a damn bit of good unless you practice climbing in a very particular way. And you, as you said earlier, you're incredibly present in each moment. Actually, that's beautifully articulated. The one thing I would add is 
I don't believe you can will that on yourself. I believe you have to put yourself into uh, a situation that that could be extremely uncomfortable. And the same thing with the cognitive behaviors that um, we learn. You can put yourself through the learning curve to integrate, but most people stop because it's not a straight line. I know, for example, if I'm a tell assertive person, I hear what you're saying about listening skills and that I need to do this and do this and do this and be aware of my body language. And as I'm doing that for the first few times, I'm feeling very uncomfortable. And as I keep doing it, I get into a, what is called the phony feeling phase. And I feel really phony about that. Not just do I feel phony, but you give me signals that I come across as phony because I'm not congruent. Right. It takes X number of repetitions, and we've got some stats on that before I get to the comfortable phase, but I still don't own it until that's integrated. And going through that, that curve becomes literally the hero's journey. Mm. The hero's journey for me was climbing the mountain and getting to know who I was, discovering this guy. And I had no idea who I was until I started climbing. You know, I worked my butt off in track and field and in tennis and everything, always attempting to prove myself in my little business that I had growing at 700% from 17 employees in seven years. But that still was not enough. It's never enough when you're an athlete. Yeah. Actually, I shouldn't say for some people, it wasn't for me. Right. I needed to find myself. Yeah. Yeah, the... Um... That's a beautiful description of how, of why I think after, as you said before, six months, oftentimes people forget what workshop they were even in, you know, a half a year ago, because that journey that's required of each of us is by its nature uncomfortable. And we human beings don't like to be uncomfortable. So around here, around here in these parts where I live, we call that the pursuit of the OSM, which stands for the oh shit moment. Mm -hmm. uh, and and the uh, and that's that's why that's important, because growth doesn't happen without it. And the intellectual understanding is easy. And that's why it's 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 um, we get, you know, such a common occurrence of the pretender, or as we like to call it, the poser, who's saying all the right things, appears to be doing the right things, dressing up, metaphorically speaking, in the right way, but nothing has shifted inside. So you climbed a mountain. You climbed many mountains to have that experience. What about the rest of us who have no intention of doing such a thing? How do we find our, what are some of the ways in which we find our transformations on the same scale without, without scaling in that way? I, th I think there are a number of ways of doing that. Um, meditation is certainly one, just really getting a deep sense and appreciation of how, um, how magnificent our bodies are, how magnificent this whole universe is and, and how beautifully it hangs together. You know, when we think in terms of this earth being a, a ball of molten lava at some point or molten rock and it gradually cooling and becoming soil over time because of certain conditions and life forms starting to develop in terms of plants and, um, and creatures and how the soil is perfect to grow those plants. Our bodies are perfect to take from that what we need to be this, these magnificent machines that, you know, you couldn't replicate if you even attempted to in any way, shape or form. Unless you can really get a sense of that magic, which I think you can do through meditation or you can do through different kinds of experiences, um, even taking, you know, a communication skill, for example, and working it through to the point where I'm so comfortable with it that I now own it 
is a path to toward that. So you know, I was I was struck. This is this is a very again kind of a deeply philosophical sort of a question. But as you were, uh, you kind of laid out the history of the of the universe for us in in a few words, and it just sounds it sounds so beautiful and effortless that evolution one thing leads to another and the interconnected nature of of nature uh just it just happens it just it just flows uh and then and then it comes down to us as individuals and we got to work so damn hard why why do we have to work so damn hard when nature just unfolds seemingly effortlessly in the process what it, is it something we do to ourselves as human beings where we're overcomplicating things absolutely because what again from my perspective is if if a person is whole and complete they raise families that are whole and complete because what we know is most kids come out of high school having a sense of not being good enough not having a clue who they are mm -hmm. at age one age two age three they were rambunctious and played and everything seemed to be in harmony and worked and then gradually the way we have conditioned them they have lost that capability mm -hmm. and now we need to relearn that and again if we go to some of the what we call primitive tribes you really see how our how harmoniously they work and play and live together. And they won't violate their jungle, for example. They will look after their jungle. The Bushmen in, in Africa would pray over the, before they um, put a poison dart into an antelope. And then they would pray with the antelope that it would feed them and not you know, um, back, have a backlash because of what they did. That's congruency. We've lost that through our own Western culture. And that's what we're striving to get back to. And that's what you're striving to get back to within corporations. You're striving to have people realize that love is just damn good business. <laughs> because exactly. that's the only way to thrive. That's the only way that we can really harmoniously work together and make this world a better world. And, and why shouldn't we be able to do that in a business context? I, there's, there's no universal law written anywhere that says, you know, um, love is, is something that we all, we all strive for and want, we all want at least, and, and it applies everywhere, um, but does not apply Monday through Friday between the hours of nine to five. It just doesn't make any sense to, to me at all. It doesn't, and it does, because if I really deep down have a sense of not being good enough. Everything that happens outside of me threatens me. Hmm. And I now need to uh, fend against that. And it could be through being very arrogant. It could be through being a bully. It could be by receding into the background and, um, and disappearing, becoming a lace affair manager or leader. It's all about self-preservation. Right if I'm not feeling good enough, but if I feel strong internally, and I don't mean strong over somebody, but that I don't need to always look for what's in it for Werner, what's in it for Werner, is this gonna hurt him? Am I giving too much away? But focus externally, which is really what you're all about, Steve. You can't love somebody if you're not focused externally. And unfortunately, you know, we find just the right person that we can love and we can experience, but we can't seem to transcend that into others. And so often the person that we really love at some point because of behavioral differences or anticipation uh, or even um, outcome differences, you know, now becomes um, separate from us. We stop loving them. How can that be if we love them once? How can we not continue to love them and just understand that they are different and have different needs? Yeah, it's a beautiful balance between, I'm struck by one of the uh, examples that you gave from the mountain leading, leading a team of people. There are times where you have to be forceful, but there are never times, I'm paraphrasing what you said, 
There are never times where you shouldn't, I'm using lots of double negatives, there are never times where you shouldn't be empathetic. In other words, you should always be empathetic even when you're being forceful. And, and, and sometimes, because the situation demands it, and it's my empathy that's requiring that I'm forceful in this moment to save your life or to save you from, from making a, you know, a, a terrible career move or whatever. And I think, I think sometimes people confuse love, real love in a business context with simply just trying to make people happy all the time and always being the nice person <laughs> and always smiling. And it's, it's far from that. Yeah, totally. Because if you've committed something to me, I can be forceful around expecting that you will do this and being forceful around finding out why didn't it happen and being forceful around, you know, what do I expect you to do next time if you commit to it? Right. Don't make a commitment to me that you're not planning to keep. Because and it's I not and it's not my ego that's demanding that of you. It's my love for you that's demanding that of you because I want to see you live up to yourself. Uh, yeah, because I equate a good leader to sometimes be like a good parent. Strict in terms of what the expectations and the agreements are, but always considerate of the other person and how they feel. Because the minute I damage that feeling, I've got somebody that's now going to avoid me whenever they can. And they'll stop, uh, they'll start disrespecting me because I've now stepped on their toes. Maybe right. it was unintentional, but that's the damage or that's the problem. No leader and in, very few leaders intend to damage their people and yet they do it because they don't know any better because right. they haven't gone through their own inner journey. Right. They haven't found themselves, they haven't grounded themselves in their own magnificence, in fact. So it's not selfish, but yes, in their own magnificence, they need to ground themselves. Very nicely said. So you had a goal uh, to celebrate your 80th birthday on Mount, Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, which was now three years ago, right? Your 80th mm -hmm. birthday. So did that happen? It did. And I celebrated my 81st on Kilimanjaro. And that was my ninth climb. My first goal was to celebrate my 65th on top. Wow. And then uh, unfortunately, last year's climb got deferred and this year's climb got deferred. So hopefully I can get back to Kilimanjaro and Everest Base Camp next year with a group of people, of course, because I so want them to experience what I experienced on these um, journeys. So has there ever been has there ever been a journey, a particular climb that where you had you had a goal either to some maybe it's the summit, but you didn't make it? Twice. It took me three attempts to climb Mount McKinley, which is now called Denali. The very first time we got within 200 vertical feet from the summit and the summit was only 20 minutes away. So it was a very, very gentle slope to the summit, but it was 7.30 at night. The wind was gusting like crazy and clouds were moving in. Um, time of night was not a problem because, you know, you have daylight even at midnight. So that wasn't a problem, but because of the wind and the cold and the clouds moving in, we had to go down. And when we came back, everybody was so disappointed that I hadn't done it and I hadn't succeeded. And all I could think of, what the heck? It was most phenomenal. And I've got the <laughs> chance to go back. <laughs> <laughs> then a few years later, went back and got trapped at high camp for nine days. Wow. We had to get up during the night to shovel snow off the top of the tents to keep them from collapsing. Ran out of food, ran out of fuel, found a little window to escape down and succeeded in doing that. The mountain was closed for another five, five days and we didn't have enough food. So, so the accomplishment there was, was living through it. Actually, I wouldn't change it. <laughs> yeah. And you, how old were you then? 
Yeah, it was 2006, my apologies. So I was 40, 50, 60, 60, 64, 65. 64, 65, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I get to go back again. Yeah, and did, and again, we were almost caught by weather. We needed to, ideally, we would have acclimatized at high camp for one day before heading for the summit, but we had heard that weather was moving in, so we went for the summit made it and got down before the weather really hit and it did hit <laughs> yeah that's that's incredible i mean the the obvious thing that i'll point out here is we get so focused on our goals that we think that anything short of of achieving what that articulated goal was is in some way a failure and what you're describing is that is just not the case it's a yeah, different it's just it's a different experience yeah. that has its own value. And then it gives you another opportunity to go and hit that goal again. What I learned from that is the real meaning of the words that everybody knows. The journey is the destination. Right. Because it, in that situation, it really is. This, there was a model of it. So Werner, is there, is there a time in your foreseeable future where you're just gonna stop climbing or is it gonna be determined by when you stop breathing? I mean, is it going to be something you just plan on doing for the rest of your life? Or will there be kind of final farewell, like a band does a farewell tour, you do a farewell climb? It'll depend on my physical capabilities. Right now, I'm struggling with knee issues. And um, unless I get them healed, more than likely this coming year, a trip to Everest Space Camp and another one to the top of Kilimanjaro will be it. However, I'm working with somebody out of Vancouver, Canada, who thinks he can support me in me healing my knees without having any knee replacements. Uh -huh. So that's what I'm working on right now. Very cool. So we'll be looking forward, looking forward to that, um, to hearing how that turns out. Now, here's the question that I have for you um, by way of advice. All of us, every one of us, without exception, is getting older. That's the definition of being on this planet, as it were. I don't know what it's like on other planets, but at least on this planet, that's the way it works. So I know that for myself, you know, when I think about my business and the future of my business and the things I want to accomplish, there's a little part of me that says, well, how much time do I really have to do it? You know, I'm 63 years old. Do I want to, is this, is it, is it worth it for me to pick up, you know, pick up a new skill or to try something new or to or to start a new aspect of my business because you know how much of that time do we have left is it is it 10 years is it 20 years is it 30 years is it i mean for all we know it could be tomorrow we just don't know but there's a part of us i think in our in our society in our conditioning that says there is a point at which we should just settle down and not think about the future so much or think about what we want to accomplish or create because you can't teach an old dog new tricks you know that whole thing <laughs> so so what would what advice would you give to those of us who might be a little bit ensnared in that way of thinking key thing i would say is for me at least the moment i sit back and i stop dreaming i may as well not be here there's always more to learn there's always more to do and certainly my body is not as capable today as it was 20 years ago. But that doesn't mean that I need to stop following my passions. And I think one of the absolute keys for people, and I didn't know this in my first 60 or 70 years of being on this planet, which is ridiculous, is to become very quiet and to really start looking at what turns me on what fuels me? What in my past did I love to do and I'm no longer doing? Or asking the question, if money were no object, what would you do with your life right now? Not in 10 years time, right now. And let the 10th year evolve out of having pleasure and meeting your own inner drive in the moment because all we ever do is live in the moment and yet 
so much of the time. We, we're not there. But that's certainly something I learned on the mountain. You only have this moment and you only have this time to enjoy. It's not 10 years from now or being a millionaire. It's what's happening now. And there's a lot to do with loving yourself. And by definition, this moment is not a function of how old you are. Because this because it's always this moment, no matter what your age. I hadn't even thought of that, and that is absolutely accurate. Yeah. Beautiful. I wish we'd learned this at age 10. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> this moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no regrets, just this moment. That's a that's a past oriented statement. Uh, that's Actually, that's so true because what happened at age ten led to my capabilities and my experience of this moment. So yeah, I'll, I'll take that back. Yeah, yeah, it's fan fantastic. Wow, what a uh, what a wonderful uh, journey you've just taken us on, Werner. And I love your descriptions of the mountain. I, I felt like I was up there with you, and honestly, that's as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> Jeez, that's that's not my jam as it were but man how inspiring and the lessons the lessons for all of us whether we ever climb a mountain or not metaphorically speaking we're all climbing our own mountains every day oh and, totally and, and it's it, very clear from the way you communicate that you have gone through your inner journey whatever that was it's um you couldn't be this present if you hadn't well, th thank thank you for saying so. It's it's an ongoing journey, certainly, mm -hmm. and as we've talked about in in some of the recent episodes of this podcast, it, in in something that I don't I don't often talk about publicly. But you know, I started meditating when I was thirteen years old. Oh, good on and, you! And and uh, that doesn't mean that I've done it every day since, but I did for decades, certainly <laughs> after that. Um, and I'm you know since uh, since the days of the COVID. You know, I started I, I started turning back inward a lot myself, and I think a lot of people have. And, you know, bringing meditation more into my, uh, into my daily practice, meditation and breathing and that kind of thing. It makes a huge difference. And in some of the, the clients that I work with, I've been encouraged them, encouraging them to do the same. And it's, it is that experience of, of the moment. And it does something. There's some effect that it has on the act of climbing the mountain again metaphorically you know the the journey that we all go on every day if we don't take the time to just settle down for a little bit and be quiet the experience of of being in business of of, of being in relationship with people of of striving takes on a very different kind of a characteristic mm -hmm. And it is fun to be able to turn that into a something that we're conscious of and present in. And it sometimes takes an example of somebody like you to have us reflect on what that means for us. So you've given us a great gift uh, through sharing your story, giving us the gift of reflection on our own. I'm speaking now. I'm speaking on behalf of everybody who's listening. <laughs> That's <laughs> how magnanimous of me. Uh, speaking for myself, thank you for for giving me the opportunity to reflect on my own journey. So, how can people uh, get in touch with you, Werner? What's the best way to connect? Easiest way is um, email, and it's just simply Werner, and that's W E R N E R, not A Werner at quest and then the number 736.com not and west we, quest got it well we'll put it in we'll put it in the blog post the show notes you know the usual places where you put stuff like that and uh it's just been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining us and thank you everybody for tuning in uh and until next time do what you love in the service of people who love what you do Thank you for listening to another episode of Love is Just Damn Good Business with Steve Farber. Join us again next time because when customer and employee satisfaction just isn't enough anymore, we are here to back you up with specific ideas to operationalize love to make an enormous difference in your business, personal life, and the world around you. Visit our website at stevefarber.com to leave a review. 
And don't forget to share the love with your colleagues and friends. Because after all, it's just damn good business. Business.